So, um, my name is Sumandro. I tweet at Ajantrix. Uh, initially, I wanted to talk about the art of uh, analysis of data with the R written in the specific way because I wanted to talk about using R the software, R the language, and the compiler, and analysis of data. Um, I had a feeling that um, the audience, uh, there would be people in the audience who use different kind of techniques in software uh, to work with uh, quantitative data. So if I would keep out the R part, I'll just talk about the, um, the art of analysis of data and, um, and show some R bits um, just for uh, people who are interested. Um, the thing about the, the attraction of analysis of data and why you should be aware of the art of analysis of data um, comes from the fact that it's, it remains the best uh, sample data giving national averages in our country, right? Um, this particular table, I, I, I'm an economist, but I mostly work on urban development issues. So I was working on affordable housing policy. And this, this is one fascinating table that, um, that I took out of NSSO data, of 2008-9 housing uh, sample survey data. I don't want to get into the details of it. All I want to say is, so this gives you per capita floor area of um, people living in India. Of course, it's a sample data that you can you can create national estimates based on this. Um, just look at, um, do you understand what is a, a quantile class, a quintile class? So MPC is um, monthly per capita expenditure, and these are the quantile classes. So if I take the per capita expenditure, the monthly per capita expenditure of the entire population of India, and I order, uh, and I um, arrange them in the order of increasing per capita monthly expenditure, and they divide the population in terms of 0 to 20 percent and 20 to 40 percent and so on. So the five classes. This gives you the per capita floor area given the kind of housing this is. Pakka is, <coughs> what is Pakka? Anyhow. So um, first thing is Pakka. Concrete. Concrete. concrete houses, semi-concrete houses and non-concrete are structure is uh, made of materials that, that, can, that, that decays. So all kind of organic materials. Right? Um, what it tells you is, Till the 60 to 80 quintile class, which means 80 percent of population in India, um, the average per capita floor area um, is around 10 square meters. That means if I take the national average of five people um, per household, that gives you a 50 square meter house for the 80 percent of the population. And the argument that I was trying to make is that given this kind of a situation, so also uh, 50 uh, square meter household means for, in, in government terms, it's called the economically weaker section housing. So it gives a certain kind of, um, what to say, if somebody wants to build an EWS housing, economically weaker section housing, it gets certain kind of subsidies, um, so on and so on. What I was trying to argue basically is that the subsidies given to the housing is completely um, insufficient to target the kind of housing needs India has, given this is the real picture of what kind of, what size of housing people are living in, in India. Um, this is fascinating because you cannot, you can take out this kind of data. Um, throughout the other parts of the presentation, I'll keep talking about the pitfalls of NSSO. Data, using NSSO data, acquiring NSSO data, and sometimes even publishing NSSO data, right? Um, and, and navigating all this pitfall is the, the art of necessity. Um, this is roughly the structure of the presentation. I, I begin with a brief history of um, the sample survey. I talk about certain concepts which are in use in the sample survey. And I talk about data organization. So I, I stop my talk in talking about data organization just to tell you that um, what you really need to understand when working with NCSO data is how the data is organized. After that, whether you're using SPSS or Stata R, Python for that matter, um, that's really up to you. And there's no need to get stuck in one kind of software or language. Um, starting with the history of NSSO data. Um, it began in 1862, which is when the statistical committee was created by the colonial administration, just to get a sense of what is happening in this country. Right? I don't want to go through all these points. You can probably this would be up on the net, you can read it up later. Um, what I, want to, what I want to tell you, or what I want to focus your attention now is the fact is that it had a very strong commercial interest from the beginning. So the colonial administration's primary interest 
first tracking what kind of commerce is taking place in, in the subcontinent. And if you still look at, um, if you still look at the present um, themes of collection of data under NSSO, you will see that NSSO collects data on housing. So that's one important market for you. It collects data on health facilities, as well as health seeking practices of individuals, which is again a big market for you. It talks about data investment um, um, statistics for the entire population of India, again a very important market. So I, I also feel that NSSO data is sometimes, um, it's, it's seen as governmental data, and it's, it's about administration, and it's not about the markets. So a lot of um, market-driven analytics work usually um, not look at NSSO data, which I think is a, is a, is a sad situation. Um, in 1947, oh, sorry. In 1947, of course, PC Mahal and Navis, which is the big story, he gets appointed as honorary statistical advisor. CSU is the initial name that was given to the center that was created. It was later called the Central Statistical Organization. It's in, I mean, at the present, it's part of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Must be. Um, for the concepts I talked about, the fact that NSSO data doesn't come, so when you go to CSO, the Central Statistical Organization, ask for data, you have to tell them what round and what scheduled data you want. Okay? So round gives you, um, each round is each annual collection of data by NSSO. So if you say, if you go and tell them that I want the 2008-9 data on something, uh, they would rather appreciate if you say that we, I want 67th round of data. Okay. So that's how it works. The list is there in the, in the CSO uh, website, so that's not too difficult to look at. Up. Schedule is the thematic focus. So what NSSO does is, unlike census, which is a complete enumeration on one hand, and also it is a one questionnaire every 10 years. And there's some additions, but the thematic focus doesn't change. It's not that one census talks about housing, the next one talks about health facilities. NSSO, on the other hand, it's not complete enumeration, so it's only sample data. Sample data makes it difficult, not difficult, it makes it impossible for you to understand anything um, below the level of what they call the state region. So if you want district level averages, you cannot get that in NSSO, which is a major limitation. So what the state region is, okay, I'll come back to the region, sorry. So, um, so what she does is, she do says that, um, so this year NSSO would undertake um, sample <coughs> survey on say four different thematic areas. It's consumption expenditure, employment, unemployment, data investment, and quality of housing, okay? So all of these are called different schedules. There are some schedules which are repeated every five years. So for example, consumption expenditure schedule, NSSO would do say on 60, 60th round, then again on 65th round. And these are called the thick rounds. So these are called the quinquennial surveys, or surveys that are repeated every five years. So if you want a good time series of data, you should look for the thick series. Because that is where you get every five years, very good sample data. At least state level averages are perfect. It's the best you can get. I mean, it's not perfect, of course. There are data collection issues, so it's awesome. There are minor rounds, or minor, not minor rounds, there are minor schedules, which are called the thin rounds. These are the schedules which are not um, repeated in such a regular frequency. So for example, 2002 was one housing uh, schedule, 2008-9 was another, and we don't know when the next will be. So there was a 96, there was 2002, there was 2008-9. So roughly a six year cycle, but it's still, it's, uh, it's, it's not so regular and, you, and the, the, the bigness of the sample is also limited. So, so thick are, are, the, are the major schedules, thin are the minor schedules. I was already talking about state region. State region is a cluster of districts within each state. So each state is carved up between usually three to four state regions. And at the state region level, at the level of aggregation of three or four districts, NSSO sample survey gives representable statistics, not below that. So that's another question often comes up that whether NSSO can tell me about the city of Bangalore, it really cannot. It can tell you about Bangalore, urban, Bangalore, rural, a couple of other districts as a total. Right? Um, <coughs> is this what, what I should be looking at? Sure. Is this what, what I should be looking at? Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh. Sorry? Okay. 
Um, so the fixed width data format is again, I mean, the, the, the concern with um, NSSO data. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, one sample just to make it clearer. So this is what NSSO data looks like, okay? It's really not very pretty. Uh, anybody who worked with the census data here? So census data is, is really much more nicer. First, it comes in Excel sheets or access database. It gives you a variable and gives you nice columns. You can understand what each number is talking about, right? NSSO doesn't. And this is the trick. So the trick is, the trick with working with NSSO and the art of working with NSSO data is to get this data into a format which is structured, which is something you can work with, right? And also to assign variables on this data because the raw data itself doesn't come with the variables. So this format is called, um, what? Just a second. Okay. So this format is called the fixed width data format. What it does is each row has a fixed width, okay? So say it has a width of 150 characters. So each width can only take 150 characters. Again, this uh, peculiarity of the data, you should read it in, in the, through the history of NSSO data. NSSO is not something that started happening 10 years back. It started happening 50 years back. And the, the data handling capabilities then were severely limited and had to be done manually. And then again, the early computer. And so some, somehow there are a huge lot of hangovers coming from such technologies, such data technologies, into the present practice of NSSO data. So the schedule file gives you the questionnaire for that schedule. So if the survey was about housing, the schedule file will give you the full questionnaire. I'll, I'll show you one as well. The layout file tells you which questions are mapped to where in the raw data that I showed you, right? So it tells you what questions, what variables are to be found where in the raw data. So the trick is to take the layout file and the raw data and put them together and create a structured data format. Okay. Um, come to data organization, right? Now well, you talked about fixed width file, which is a comes in TXT file. There is binary coding of information. That means it doesn't have yes no. It wouldn't have um, the person's state is say Karnataka. It would have the person's state is number twenty seven. So the entire is in, in terms of numbers. It, there is no. There's a word in alphabets and work. There are a list of supporting files which tells you about um, how to go through, how to work with that data. So the schedule file I talked about, that's the question. The layout file tells you where the variables are in the data set. The readme file gives you some more um, information. Usually what it tells you is that if there are, say, five data files, what they do is they basically um, categor not categorize, they divide up the entire data in terms of number of states. So it tells you which data file has the data for Karnataka. So if there are five data files, one of them would have the state number 27, and it tells you that these state codes are in that data file. That's what usually the readme file does. The state and district codes are very important if you're working with it. It tells you that number 273 is, uh, so Bangalore follows in number 273. So 27 is the state code, 3 is the state uh, is the region code, together with the state region code would be 273, something like that. Uh, the real difficulty comes in with the, um, again, going back to what I was saying about fixed width files, is the, I, the thing about levels come in because each row has 150 characters. And the entire questionnaire cannot be coded in, in 150 characters. So answer given by one person or one household has to be shown in multiple rows, right? Um, so these multiple rows are called multiple levels. So each, each uh, set of answers by one person is divided up into multiple rows. Each level is called a row. There's a variable called level which gives you number 0, 1, number 0, 2, 0, 3, takes different values, which you can use to understand what exactly that row is about or what part of the question that row is referring to. Right? Um, Another major difficulties, of course, as well, that say for, um, for all uh, schedules really, so say for consumption expenditure, there will be some questions that would be, that would be at the household level, 
and some questions asked to each individual of the household. So if you're taking the entire schedule and you're working with 16 different um, variables from across the, across the questionnaire, uh, you always have to keep in mind that certain variables needs to be multiplied by the household size so that they're all comparable or divided by household size. Right? Because it can be also month, monthly per capita expenditure of the household and not the, or not the individual. And you have to keep that always in mind when you work on this. Um, what I was talking about levels, I'll, I'll try to show it in a you know, simple example. So what happens is the schedule um, see, tells you that the first question is what's the serial number of a person, right? Um, layout tells you that the serial number is coded in column one to three. Uh, is this visible mostly? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Um, so you know that the first three numbers in each row tells you the serial number of the person to whom this row refers to, right? Uh, please uh, ask me questions if something is not clear. Uh, question. Sorry. Yeah. If one individual has three or four levels, right. then uh, the first level will have the first serial number. Right. The second will also carry that this is serial number to the I'll just come to that. Yeah. Well, yes. I'm, I'm noticing this is kind of like the Jurassic era of uh, data representation. Sadly, Has so someone yes. brought it down to like the last hundred years of uh, the thing by maybe creating a database which has looked at this zoo of data and has actually translated them into SQL tables or anything like that? Not yet. Are doing it? Um, as per NSSO, they're supposed to start publishing, I think. I mean, uh, we can quit expecting NSSO to do something. Do I mean, if they haven't got the message by now, they won't. <laughs> well, but half of that answering? thing, half of making it a SQL queryable um, database, <laughs> that has been done in Azim Benji University where I was working. Okay. So, uh, the part that has not been done is getting this um, structured data into a SQL database. That hasn't been done yet even there. So what we did is we took the unstructured data, not unstructured, <coughs> it's fairly structured, but as you see it structured in Jurassic uh, time um, customs, right? Um, took that data and structured it in a more easy to understand way. Um, but the next part hasn't been done. So let's see if, um, and that, and the qu what question also has, um, it raises concerns regarding the copyright of the data. Whether somebody is actually allowed to do that. I mean, it's the government. That is not too clear. Okay. I mean, it is the government, but it's a government data product. So you cannot just take it out, um, put it in a SQL database, and make it available for others to either freely access or buy. Right. So there, there is a catch there. Um, right. So what we're saying is that so so the first three characters were about that. The second to about the age. So we know that for one to one and three four three, these two different versions, the fourth and fifth character gives their age, right? The daily wage is given by the next four columns. So this is how it would have looked like had it been there only one fifty things or one fifty had one fifty characters been sufficient to capture the entire question, right? But sadly it doesn't. So what happens is um, there would be multiple rows. Each row about the same person would have the ID number or the unique ID number of that person in all of the rows, right? So that is fixed. So it would have one to one and one to one. So serial number would be there in columns one to three for all columns. But the thing is that column four, which is two and four here, that gives the level number, okay? So what is the person's age is given by column 5 and 6, which is 12. But we have to only look at levels. We have to only look at rows with level is equal to 2, as I said here, and take the columns 5, 6 as, as the age variable. OK? What happens is if I'm, and there would be another row, and say the daily wage is encoded in the next row, which has the code 4. So the 3434 three, four becomes the wage, though in the original data file, um, the column locations are the same for daily wage and age. Right? 
Um, please tell me if I need to repeat anything. Just, just repeat a bit. You know, Done. Okay, so what you have is, um, so there are multiple uh, rows about each person, right? One, two, three is the person's ID. That remains fixed throughout all rows. Column number five gives you, or column number four, sorry, gives you the level number. So on the, on the right hand side of that row, how you are looking at column structures, or width of columns, is determined by what value that level variables is taking. Because different levels have variables of different column width. Yeah? A, a bit clear? Yeah. yeah. yeah? So what happens is, um, so if I just go back a bit. Right. Not easy to see here, but say 1 to 1 and 1 to 1, that's a serial number. 2 and 4 are the different levels, level number 2, level number 4. Then I have 1, 2, 1, 2 and 3, 4, 3, 4. 1, 2, 1, 2 and 3, 4, 3, 4 are actually talking about different variables because the level number is different. So this 1, 2, 1, 2 is in a particular box, as in a, is in a particular row of a particular column, right? Of course, yeah. Right. But in the, in the raw data file itself, as I showed you here, there is no separation given to understand where a variable ends and begins. So you have a key for you know. Exactly. So what you have is, so what you have is something like this. So this is the schedule file, and it's it's. Uh, so these are recent uh, schedule files that are actually pretty easily um, parsable. So these are Excel files which, with with um, fixed column locations for different things. So you can actually take this and immediately create something like, um, sorry, I don't want to show you that yet. Um, so what we do is we create something like this. I'll just uh, increase the font. <coughs> so we create something like this. So we create a standard um, text file, the description and column range as two variables. So serial ID is 1 to 2, round schedule number is 3 to 6, and so on. So I take the uh, Excel file, get it into a text file, make it easy to understand what is happening in each um, each width. Um, you want to see a bit of R? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. So this is the bit of R I want to show. Um, <laughs> so what you do is you take a variable called codes, you read the table that I just showed, code.txt, right? Um, uh, don't even think about what is what's happening the parameters, you can work it out later. Um, then what I do is I split the range, which is say 1 to 2, using the split character hyphen. Okay, So that's again pretty straightforward. Um, I tell them what is the beginning column, what's the end column, just to understand. So the R already knows that, say the ID is, so for the, for the variable ID, the beginning of the range is location 1. The end of the range is location three, within the within the row, right? Um, then I create another another variable data. I read a fixed width file. This is the name of the fixed width file. Widths are given by the column width um, variable within quotes. Um, column names are given by the description variable within quotes. Um, please ask me if I need to repeat. Five more minutes, okay. I'm mostly done. Have you published all this? Or? Um, no, not really. Okay. No. No, but I should, right? <laughs> oh, if you can, I'll be useful. Right, I, I think I, I, would, I will, yeah. yeah. Um, there's some other codes which uh, really we should not be looking at right now. Um, then what we do is, um, have any, everybody used uh, the R here? Yes. Okay, a lot of you. Um, that's nice, that's nice. Um, I just want to show you this. Shit, sir. Right, so, um, so that's what you do. Basically, you take the, okay, the, the, okay let me go through the logical structure again. So you take the description of the variable, the name of the variable. You take the column width, or the column location, rather. So one, two, three, three third, from the first to the third character, from the fourth to the sixth character, and so on. For each level, you do this, okay? 
Then what you do is you take the data set, you say that um, read this data set given this um, column information, and then delete every row which is not level is equal to one. Then you repeat the process for the next level. So you have the, that entire data set for each level, and you already have the person's ID. So you take different data sets and put them together, merging it by the person ID. That, that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, I mean, it requires some process, but it's, um, it can be done without uh, too much work. R is uh, really nice to work with, uh, which is the reason I wanted to talk about R here. Um, what you can do is you can just, um, so I, I personally like uh, working in a, in a text uh, editor. So you use Notepad or something like that to write the R code. Um, yeah, pardon. Is every row only one level? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, things would be impossible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. see, that, that's also the that's also the part of the art of appreciating NSSO data. You have to appreciate the fact that these guys are really good at their work as well because it's a lot of data, and they have been doing this without um, using most of the techniques we use. Right? 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 Obfuscation. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so the 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 re, I mean, it's, there's a, there's a I mean significant amount of logic behind this, but anyhow, it, anyhow, so. Um, so you can write up your R code in a text file, and you can just run, you can save it as .r, and it runs directly in R. I'm using R Studio, which is a really nice IDE for R. Um, on, the, on this part, it's not visible, I know. On this part, you can, you can uh, take a look at your entire code. So it allows you um, on the fly debugging, which is really helpful. Um, if you run it um, directly here, on the console part here, you can see what's happening. If it's getting stuck somewhere, if it's delivering something. At the moment, it's still running, so I'll wait a bit. Um, so this is a slow computer. Um, right, and then what you can do is, sorry. And then you can see something like this directly. So what, what I'm doing here is I'm basically breaking up um, the entire data set by each uh, column position, which I can easily uh, merge certain column position given the code.txt already created, the column regions I've already defined. Um, you can also do this and say if the column location number, say, 7 is not equal to 1, then delete all the rows. Which is the same as saying that all levels which are not equal to one needs to be deleted. All rows with not level is equal to one gets to be deleted, and all is done. Right. So, um, so that's about it. The um, the last thing I want to talk about is um, this is a really nice visualization library called Google Lists, uh, which, which what it does is it, it uses the Google Charts. If I'm done. You know. Um, what it does is it takes a Google Charts API and uh, creates a Google Chart um, visualizations on the fly from R. So what it basically does it takes the data, it, it has it uses the JSON IO library to output as JSON object, uses the JSON object to create uh, Google views uh, on the fly. This is something we have been using and I can show um, example later.